This episode of Broken Bones and Bullshit is sponsored by Ozcan Rural. Dave Chilcott, welcome on. Yeah, it's good to be here, mate. <laughs> good to finally meet you, the Victorian up north. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did the whole rodeo start for yourself? Well, mate, I was, I was pretty much born on a, born on a, a small property, and my old grandfather was a horsebreaker, and um, I was such a shit of a kid that when I started crying like that, they just used to put me in, in front when he was out mustering or whatever on the saddle and that had sent me to sleep. <laughs> so, so, yeah, and it ended up, I sort of, I looked pretty sleepy on bareback horses at the end of my career now in our life. But, but yeah, I started off on a property and um, I used to love getting on calves, just little calves, you know, that's right. And then the local Jim Carners had come around with calf rides, so I rode calves up until I was about 12. And then I started really... I guess I was really getting hooked on bigger rodeos. So all Bushman's Carnival rodeos where I where I grew up at Kurumbong on the in the Ho Valley there. But um, yeah, so and then I sort of uh, progressed to riding steers and and um, bullocks and stuff like that. And parents really didn't want me to, but I used to sneak away and go <laughs> with other blokes to different. Was the um, was there bulls back then? Like bull riding back then? <laughs> Not or? many bull riding. Yeah. Bushman's Carnival, mate. They mainly had. Mainly had steer riding, bullock riding, a few places had bull rides, but um, the old AAA, the Pro Circuit, they, they were sort of the first with bulls, you know, mm. dating right back to the early Hill Brothers and people like that that, <laughs> yeah, that bought a Bronco Trust that had, <clears throat> that had bulls. And we just used to look at the pictures and hear about them and read about them and, <laughs> and then just go along to Walker Rodeo or whatever, where there's a good old, the old Hereford <laughs> Bullocks again, you know. And then I sort of, Progressed into riding saddle broncs in the old slide and seat Davison and Smith slide and seat Foley, <laughs> and um, that was that was okay. But the Bushmen's Carnival, they they really didn't have any like um, a lower rank to ride in um, like the pro circuit did. So you were riding against those old champion cowboys that had been around for years and years and years. <laughs> but it was still fun, you yeah. know. <laughs> and um, I went to a rodeo at Moss Vale, south of Sydney and jumped on a train and went down there with my gear and I watched a guy called Colin Thorne um, who was a champion cowboy in the Bushman's Carnival and he was riding a bareback horse there and I just looked at him and all and I thought that's what I want to do. <laughs> so I took off on the avenue of riding bareback horses, you know, which um, was to no avail. Still didn't, <laughs> still didn't make any money out of that. But, but that's how I sort, of, I sort of progressed through. I left home, oh, I think when I was about 15 or 16 and... Uh, Sort of ducked down on mum and dad. And got a job working up on a big place in the in the Hunter Valley, out of Willow Tree. And joined up with a lot of bushy cowboys there when I was about 16, 17 or something yeah. like that. And you know how it goes. And just progressed on. Um, and what year did you start in the tent shows? Oh, the tent shows. Well, well, actually, between the tent show, I'd actually joined the uh, AWRA in 1968. And. Uh, I suppose there's still warrants out for my arrest. I was, I was, on, I was a good old day, I was on the run from the law and I couldn't think of anywhere better to go than Victoria to Myrtleford and I joined the AWRA and I made a lot of friends in the AWRA. So um, that was in 68. But in 72, excuse me, I was just looking for something. I was looking for something exciting to do, you know. I wasn't that hung up on the solid competition of radio. I loved riding, but I was a mug lad, you know. I just... You know, I used to love crowds and flags and waving and music and jumping off horses yeah. and throwing hats and all that More stuff. More of a yeah. showman. Yeah, yeah, the showman. Stuff. And anyway, um, uh, we, we were just we were married um, in 71 and um, I had a pretty quiet year that year. I didn't do any rodeos. And then uh, late 70, well, at 72, our daughter was born and, and we headed up to Gundawindi. Joined up with Jack Hill at Gundawindi Show. <laughs> and I'd ridden in the tent before and just loved it, you know. And, uh, of course, with old Jack, we started off side showing and we were just doing weekends, which was great. And we'd probably show Friday, Saturday and Sunday at any town, say Young Windy. And um, we had uh, the rest of the week off. So we would show the three days. But um, then we went on the road six nights a week, one night stand. <laughs> and, and that's when you knew. That's when you, you knew whether you were cut out for it. Or not, you know. And, and you had to set everything up. And oh yeah, yeah. We'd get into town, 
hopefully around about lunchtime from the previous town um, with one night stands, we would we'd set up, we like us, we, we weren't showing the big top canopy because it was a dry season and chances of rain were pretty slim where we were going. So we were showing with what they call side walls, which are high walls mm. and out the front of the show, we had a line-up board, just like you see at Brophy's Box and Tent. And Jack Dill, he was just a master spruker. Like, <laughs> we'd set up and there'd be nobody around at all. Next minute, within an hour, he's got a crowd out. There, <laughs> yeah. And um, so we'd set the tent up, put all the stands in, set the two shoots up. Ooh. All the stock um, were all fairly quiet stock. Like, we could lead the bulls. <laughs> um, we, could lead, we could lead all the bucking horses and... Um, if we brought a new buck and horse along the way, um, we'd break them into lead and tie them up to the truck so we could lead them from the truck into the chute for the night. Oh, so you just didn't have sort of yards out there? No, no, no yards. No, the horses were all tied to the semis. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, they all led. Yeah, they <laughs> led. Um, so it was a bit of hard work. You, you know, you might... <laughs> Jack was pretty cautious on what he bought. Um, he, he was a great horse dealer. And he, he would only sort of buy... We liked stock horses, broke-in stock horses, because we could tie them up and handle them, and they weren't going to give us any trouble, you know. And all of his, all the horses we brought from the production rodeos down in Victoria, um, he would handpick all the good, quiet horses out of that, you know, which were all top bucking horses, but some of them you could actually hop on them in the yard, just sit on them, yeah, and <laughs> they, they wouldn't buck until that <laughs> night when you, you, you run them in, you know. But um, it was a time... The Buck Jump Show was at a time before um, public liability mm. and people were suing people for different things. And, you, know, you could get away with it. Yeah, it? and people were responsible for their own actions. You yeah. went and rode in a tent show, and if you got bucked off a horse and you cut your finger, you didn't sue the tent show. You know? Yeah. Like, so it was a, a, a different era. So people were more competitive to come in and ride mm. for you the night. You could get local riders to ride if you were getting a bit sore, you know. And did they set it up like how... Um, Brophy's Boxing Ten, how they just call out to anyone that wants to challenge? Yeah, well, we only had local riders challenge. Um, they would sort of not call out for local riders. We had a lineup board, mm. and old Jack would introduce all his riders that were travelling with the show. Um, but we would already know because we were there putting the show up, someone would say, oh, you know. Uh, uh, Davy Johnson, he's coming in, he reckons he's going to challenge one of your good horses and that. So we'd be watching for Davy Johnson. We get the background, Davy Johnson. We know who Davy Johnson was, what <laughs> station he worked on, whether he could ride or not. And we'd square him up with a horse, you know, <laughs> set him up with a horse appropriate, <laughs> yeah. appropriate horse. Um, so they were the only local riders and we liked about two. We liked to have a local bareback rider and we liked to have oh, three, local bareback rider, saddle bronc rider and a local bull rider if we could get them. Um, bulls, that was a challenge getting s some bull rides because we were travelling with us the top two bulls in Australia, Dr Jekyll, oh, 007 and Dr Jekyll and another bull called the Black Stump and those bulls had big reputations <laughs> and there wasn't, so you really had to work your ass off to get a <laughs> local bull rider, yeah, yeah, you even had to change the name of the bull <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 007, I don't want to get on it. <laughs> haven't you got anything else, you know? No, so, this is B7, not 007. Yeah, 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 you missed, yeah, you missed got the numbers wrong. Right? <laughs> it was it was funny thing you say that about the local riders, Ben. We went out and bought four bucking horses between Quilpie and Charlwell. And it's old cattle yards out there, and they had a, a cap over the bloody sh crush gate, and you had to duck when the horse jumped in, case you <laughs> get on, all this sort of shit, you know. And old Jack took us out, it was just me to ride them. He ran in four horses, and uh, two big grey horses, one called Brigolo Pat, one called Beefwood, another small lot mare called, we call Mulga Mary. And you notice they're all getting named after Queensland trees, <laughs> Beefwood, Brigolo mm. Pat, Mulga Mary. And then there was a quiet mare there, and I'll, I'll get round to it in a minute about the, about the local rider. She was a quiet mare, and anyway, I said, gee, so the guy that was selling, she's quiet, that mare there, that was the last one. <laughs> anyway, he said, oh yeah, she's a broken mare. Okay, so we let her in, and I got on her, and there was a bit of a trick when you're riding the horses and you're trying to buy them, you know, like, if you can stay on them as long as you can, that's great. It means you're wearing the horse out, oh no, he was easy to ride, you know. 
But old Jack had a trick. If the horse, if you were getting into trouble on the horse he was buying, he'd call you off quick. Yeah, yeah that's enough. Get off him, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I got on this bay man. When he sang get off him, boy, I was already 10 foot above the horse with the head rain going out of my hand, you know, get off him. Boy. And we bought her. Anyway, we said to the bloke, how come she bucks and she's so quiet? And, and the bloke said, well, she hates a crapper. And for young people that haven't been around, the old slide and seat polies that they rode buck jumpers in had a, and, and horses in steep country, escarpment country, they put a piece of harness that goes in under the tail and it buckles to the back of the saddle. And it's the same as a back cinch in a western mm. saddle. It stops the saddle going over their head. Well, it turned out that this, this mare just hated those cruppers being under a tail. <laughs> and they, they were escarpment country, mm. so they couldn't use it because it, she was throwing all the ringers off as soon as they put a crupper under her tail. <laughs> so we were showing Longreach, right? We'll get down to you. I'll get around, we'll get around to what you're talking about. This is good. I, love, I just thought of this. We're, time for a local ride, and there's a big mouth, a really big mouth, mug where ringers come into the show, you know. Big bloke, but big, strong looking fella. And his mouth, I want to challenge your horses, I want to challenge your, you know, and as if he thought he was going to make a million dollars in Jack Hill's buck jump shake. <laughs> Five dollars, maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, I said to Jack, I said, oh, can I, because I was tent bossing at the time, and I used to pick a lot of horses out, and I said, well, I might stick him on Gidgy Girl, we call her Gidgy Girl, you know. And he said, yeah, yeah, give me. And I'd, we'd been bucking her in a bareback rig, and she was throwing everyone off. Anyway, it, it got right to the last minute where this bloke brought his gear in and Jack introduced him as the local rough rider from Longreach and blah 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 <laughs> and this bloke over the microphone said yeah one other thing I've heard about these tent shows using your own saddles and everything he said and I want to use my own saddle and he had his saddle there and old Jack Gill said that. and when I looked down at his saddle what's hanging off it but a crupper <laughs> It was gold, mate. It was gold. <laughs> and I looked at this crupper and I nearly pissed myself laughing <laughs> at this crupper hanging off the back of this saddle. I thought, you're gone. You're a dead man walking, mate. <laughs> and that man, someone took a photo. Like, I think it might have been David Thell. Someone was there that night, a professional photographer. And they took the photo of that mare standing on her front feet. She was almost vertical. <laughs> and this guy's sort of heading for Winton out of the tent. <laughs> it was really good. But yeah, we'd get, you know, a lot of ringers could hang up on horses, but you get the background of them, you, you know, you suit them to horses. You, do, you didn't want to see them get thrown. You wanted to see a bit of action mm. in, in the tent and that. So, but yeah, so we'd call, um, call in local riders and stuff like that. And uh, when you were travelling, what were you, you uh, getting paid per show? Well, as a rider? Well, I, I, sort of not so much per show, but per week. When I left old Jack Gill's buck jump show, I had my week's wages, and I had um, my long service leave, and my holiday pay, and some petrol money, and it came to $15.40. <laughs> <laughs> you never got paid, mate. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was married, like Kath and I and our baby were traveling, and, and um, and they sort of, yeah, Jack looked after us a bit, you know. But a lot of the other boys, you know, they'd get you know, poached eggs on toast. That was pretty good. <laughs> a couple of bucks to go down and get a sandwich at the local takeaway. You did it for love. Yeah. You did it for love. And just the lifestyle too. Lifestyle, in mate. country. Many bucking horses as you want to ride, mm. you know. And um, all good things have sort of got to come to an end. And um, after, oh, it wasn't quite six months, it was probably about five months. And... There was a lot of a lot of tent show riders we had had dropped off. They went and wanted to do other things, you know. And I was a bit more loyal um, to Jack and Brian Gills with the show, and um, so I stayed on. But it just the toll that it took on you, um, putting the tent up, pulling it down, and then getting stuck with riding say four horses every night. Yeah, and for six. Six nights straight. Yeah, six nights straight. And a lot of the time you get locals would bring their horses in. And they were friggin' rank horses. You know, <laughs> lot them, they didn't bring them in for fun. They bring them they brought them in to throw Jack Hill's riders. You know, and you were sore. You know, well, so you would have your horses for the locals and then they'll bring their horses well, you to get you it, for dinner. Gener yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally they were trying to sell them. And they had them on the place. Shell them or it was an ego thing, I'll bring my <laughs> horse in. I'll, sometimes they, they thought their horses were worth a lot of money and 
you know, it's a big operation like Gills with their, all their bucking horses and they couldn't afford to pay big money for mm. a lot of those horses back then. And there was plenty of horses around. So some guys would turn up and they'd bring in two horses, you know, and we'd put them in the ring for the day and let them walk around when the ring was first up so they got familiar with being in the ring and everything and then um, ride them at night and then Jack and whoever brought them in to sit down around the fire and discuss what they were worth. <laughs> One bloody night, he sat around a fire, must have been at three o'clock in the morning, right next to my caravan, arguing with this old fella about these three bucking horses that he had. And, and, and oh, they kept us awake, they were arguing, and having a drink and arguing again. And I thought, oh, Jack, you're not gonna get these horses. And Kath and I get back to sleep. Next morning, the horses were on a track and gone, and Jack didn't have them like <laughs> Like took him home, you know. But, uh, yeah, but that was um, it was good days and a big entertainment for the town. Mm. Huge entertainment for the town. Everyone looked forward to use coming. Everybody, and <clears throat> yeah, you know, we were talking earlier on about promoting radios. You, uh, you only get out of what you what you put, put in. in. And I remember a radio run here on the coast when I was young, about 1969, and someone gave me ten bucks to jump on a truck two days the truck drove all through surface paradise and i was on the back with a microphone spruken about <laughs> this rodeo would promote and it was huge crowds and that was the only way it was promoted so you get you get out of it what you put on it so back in those days with those old buck jump shows you sent a front man ahead and he went ahead about three weeks ahead of you and he put all the posters up in town you go gave, to the pub and yeah, and gave free tickets to where he put posters in. You get free tickets into the show, so that town had three weeks with all the ringers and property owners and whoever coming into town to see the posters and know that we were going to be there on Thursday night. Mm. And so that's why you got big crowds, and there was nothing else to do out there. Yeah, kids didn't sit online, <laughs> yeah. or play video games or anything like that. Um, there was nothing, there wasn't even any TV. <laughs> so you get people from, say, oh, sometimes four or five hundred k's away. Yeah, just the in the middle of the station and yeah, come just, in. Just come in, yeah. <laughs> Truckload of ringers would come in, they'd stay there and get on the grog for a couple of days. <laughs> you'd see, look, you could write a book on the humorous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, the bloody things that happened in that show. You know? <laughs> and you were with just the right people those old showmen, you know, to get the best out of humour that happened in those tent shows, you know, you could just, Kath and I, even today we sit around and if you ask her, what's the best time in life, she'll say, travelling with the old tent show. Mm. It was just a laugh a minute with that thing. <laughs> just, just normal people doing crazy things. <laughs> there was, um, we showed, uh, I think it was Olga Feller or Black Hall or something like that one night. <laughs> this is a, this is one of the funniest things you ever want to see. Anyway, we used to have what we call a, an event in the tent called Fun in the Stockyard. So this is what happened. We had a, a mule, <coughs> excuse me, and we had a pony. And we put them in and it was kids over about 12. We didn't let little kids in, it was too dangerous. And you had to catch the pony, catch the mule, get on him and ride round the ring for a cash prize. The <laughs> cash prize was like 50 cents. <laughs> so you get up to about a dozen kids in and those, that pony and that mule knew where they got fed and they knew who had the halter in their hand when you went in to catch them. You take the halter off them and the kids in there and they hated it. <laughs> so they'd spin around, they'd try and bite and kick and carry on. The kids, kids very rarely got on. Anyway, we're showing one night and this old ringer and his old missus, <laughs> they've come in and they've been on the turps, I think at Bark Hall, no, but somewhere Black Hall at the Barcoo pub all day on the run. And, and the old ringer, he's screaming out at the kids how to catch the horse and how to catch the mule, you know. <laughs> And then his old missus, she's been on the run too, and she said, why don't you get in and have a go? <laughs> you know? So old Jack's milking this on the microphone too. And next minute, old oh, mate, he's come down and climbed in the ring. <laughs> so he's walked up behind the pony, and the pony's kicked him ass over head. <laughs> so she's going, yeah, don't know how to And she's getting up the old man, see? <laughs> so then he turns around, and he's giving her a <laughs> Like the whole crowd's captivated. Jack's, this is gold for Jack Hill. He's just milking this <laughs> And then finally, we didn't ask it to her, didn't think she would. She comes down and gets in. The first thing she did was walk up behind that bloody mule 
And that mule backed up to it, just didn't thank God, didn't kick her in the chest, but backed up with his ass and knocked her over. And when she's gone down, she had this floral dress to about her knees. And when she's gone down, the dress has gone up over her head and she's got no gear on. She's got no, ni- <laughs> she's got no knickers on. Mate, the crowd, they'll still be, old Jack milked it. He was saying, he was saying get up and have another go, Fluffy. <laughs> The whole place just pissing themselves laughing. It was a, it was the funniest thing, and they'll still be talking about that in Blackpool. <laughs> they'll still to this day be talking about them in, in Blackpool. But oh yeah, the, the things that used to go wrong that we used to hide. Behind the <laughs> yeah. of, oh, yeah, I could great. imagine just the breakdowns with like trucks and just oh. on the road that. Well, it's just, that's a, just a truck broke down somewhere once, and um, it was battery. That there was a flat battery. So Brian was driving the truck and might, it might have had the, the tent on it or whatever it had on it. <clears throat> and he met a truckie. And the truckie said, I've got a spare battery, I'll loan it to you. And Brian said, okay, but I'll need it till about midnight because we've got to bring the truck in next to the tent. And <laughs> this bloke went, yeah, I've never been to a buck jump show, that'd be good. He said, I need a rest, I'll stop. So this bloke, you've got to picture this bloke, he's a big, tall, lanky, skinny <laughs> truck driver. He's in a blue singlet, little tight stubby shorts and a pair of plastic sandals, right? And that's all right for a truck, he's back to back then. <laughs> so he's parked his semi and he's waiting. And old Jack Gill had said to me he, when I first joined the show, he said, Chili, there might be a night when you might have to hop on the bulls, you know, if we can't get a local rider. So far, I'd had local riders. As soon as I got into a town, I'd start asking them about it. All right. I didn't want to get on 007 or Dr. Jack. <laughs> anyway, um, so this old, this bloke, and I've battled and battled till and the show's like, uh, we've got the tent up and it's nearly dark and I still haven't got a bull rider. No one's showed up, you know. And this bloke just happened to open his mouth. He said, you know, he said, I often thought, he said, I'd like to do that, you know, that bull riding thing. <laughs> and I looked him up and down. I said, what? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't disclose what the bulls were, and I didn't make too much. I said, oh, well, why don't you have a bit of a go then? <laughs> and he said, oh, you reckon so? It took me an hour to talk him into it. What that bloke didn't know was he's sitting there in a blue singlet, a little pair of tight shorts and plastic sandals, with his hand in a rope tied to the number one bucking bull in the <laughs> Never been on a bull in his life. <laughs> Just thought he'd have a bit of a go. <laughs> He took the top rung of the ladder to have a bit of a go. Oh, jeez. Yeah, and he waited around and um, we packed the, drove the truck in, packed the tent up, give him back his battery and away he went. No, no, he had to go on the bull. Uh, down. <laughs> <laughs> Downwards. Every, like everybody did off those bulls. Yeah. I think that 007 got a bit lazy one night after about three months and someone rode him, just sort of laid all over him and slapped him and carried on. And um, they tuned him up a bit the next night. He came. He was never ridden again. No, yeah, oh, well. Nah. And I don't think anyone rode Dr. Jekyll. He was number... But they all... You know, sometimes you had to, you had to sort of give the guy a break. If he was the only bull ride, put him on the black stump, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but yeah, those bulls were throwing people hell. And, and you were bucking on every, like, six nights a week? Six nights a week, yeah. yeah. Three, three bulls, yeah, which is sort of buck two. Yeah. We put our, one of our bull rides, one of our boys, tent... Ten hands, you know, tent riders would be a bull rider. So um, yeah, they sort of got a bit sick of it, then getting thrown every night for six nights. But we'd all, we'd alternate things around and put them on the black stump, and, and they'd ride the black stump. You know, yeah. it's still a good bull, but they'd sort of get him ridden. You know, but um, and the horses, you know, we sort of we had enough horses to rotate them because mm. a lot of the time they were bucking on like oh, we show Junda, and we were bucking them on um, tennis court. Like, yeah, and there was no sawmill. What we used to do was um, go to a sawmill and get wood shavings or sawdust, bag as many bags as we could fit in the truck, and that's what we bucked them on when it was oh, hard. Yeah. But out at Junda, there was no sawmill, there was nowhere to get anything, you know. And them horses, they, they were bucking on hard, bloody old tennis courts and hard, <laughs> oval, hard ovals. And Did you know that it'd be rough for the bull riders and riders? Oh, yeah. Oh, Jesus, it was hard. There was one joint we showed at. We put the tent up and everything was up and the ring was up and the chutes were in. No, big old heavy chutes in those days too. And I was in there doing something before the show and I just, I looked at the ground and I thought, that was a hole in the ground that just closed up. I thought, what the hell was that? And I went over and had a look. 
It was a trapdoor spider. But there wasn't just one. We were showing on like an oh, oval or something. There would have been a hundred trapdoor spiders. <laughs> and you should have seen like jumping off bucking horses, like <laughs> just catching up. Because you had to catch your own horse. Mm. You had to jump off and catch your horse. I was doing a lot of the catching for the other blokes that weren't that mm. sort of so good at catching, the jumping off and catching you. You get a new rider and he's never jumped off a horse in his life. He's mm. been at rodeos or whatever and pick up men getting him off and didn't know how to jump off and catch your own horse. Yeah, because you said no pick up men or nothing. No, you jumped off and caught him. And if ever you saw, you see a lot of blokes doing it now because it's, it was a little bit of a craze jumping off horses <laughs> and they're doing it well. But the beginning of all that was the old buck jump shows, and and the the three Gill boys, the three sons of the, the of, of Jack Gill, the era of um, Peter Bryan and Happy Jack, they were the specialists back when they were kids. They were jumping off bucking horses when they were 12, 14 years of age. In their tent. <laughs> yeah, and it's a little bit it's a little bit hard, you know. It's all timing and stuff like that, you know. And and you've got to be sharp every night on it. I got a bit lazy, and we had I was riding a saddle bronc in the tent there one night and I was tired, I was sore and I was lazy. There was a big horse called Bobcat we had and I, I jumped off him and one foot stayed in the iron. And he peeled my shirt off first and then he peeled every bit of skin off my back. And there was no one no one in there to catch up. I was doing the catch and, and, and I just had to wait for my foot come out of my boot and then jump up and hobble around and catch him up. <laughs> and Kathy got me, she's putting iodine or something all over me back, had no skin on it, you know. So you gotta still be sharp. Jumping yeah. off them, but those fellas back way back before my era, they they were the specialists, mm. you know. And I did a few open rodeos where I jumped off easy horses, just rare riders. <laughs> and I see a lot of blokes, fair few blokes doing it now, you know. Oscan Rural providing Southwest Victoria with everything related custom sheep and cattle yards. Get in touch with the fellas via email oscanrural at gmail dot com. That's AUS can like the one you drink, rural at gmail.com. Building fences straighter than your local politician. When did the tent show start? Like, you said they finished like 72? Yeah, they start, mate, they started, oh shit, probably back in the early 1900s. Oh, wow. Oh shit, yeah, um, Skewthorpes and McConville's and people like that, they, they started those shows off way back, you know. And they had like neck reins, just a neck rein around the horse's neck and uh, polished hunting saddles. <laughs> so how do you like to be riding in that? You know? <laughs> and rank horses, you know, rocking head and horses like that way back before my time. I was born in 1950. Mm. Um, what am I now? 74. So I'm talking about you know, 1920s and 30s. Yeah, and, wow. and then it evolved to... Um, then they sort of, sort of became an on-the-road thing back in, say, the 40s and 50s. And there was a lot of people. There was just as many buck jump shows as what there was tent shows, boxing shows, you know. Wow. Yeah, just as many. They were all over Australia. And they were entertainment. Mm. Good. And sometimes they'd have... Um, sometimes they'd have, like, um, boxing in them as well. You know, oh, just, mix the two in. Yeah, they'd mix the two in. Yeah, and um, anything for entertainment in the tent. <laughs> they'd have sharpshooters and uh, whip crackers, rope spinners, clowns. They had singers. I think oh, Gills yeah. had the Lagarde twins, which way back before our, your time, our, the Lagards were pretty big country music artists. Mm. They had them travelling with them. And, yeah, and so, yeah, and, yeah, the whole... The, and that they had one guy that was with the tent we had who could play three chords on a guitar... And sing one song, <laughs> and it was Your Cheating Heart by Hank Williams. <laughs> and he'd come out every night and sing the same song. And Brian Gill and me, we were always looking to cause shit in that show. You know, <laughs> we wanted a bit of carnage. And this bloke was a tin hand, and he'd come out and he'd sing, Good evening. And Jack had introduced him, you know, as, as Buck Slim or Slim Buck or whatever he called himself, <laughs> right? And he'd come out and he'd stagger through this song and sing, Your Cheating Heart. And Brian, Brian Gill said to me one night, why don't we make it interesting? Is we'll get, I'll get back in the crowd with a couple of ten hands and chili and that, and 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 you sing out. Okay, good day everybody. It's great to be here in Blackhall. Has anybody got a request? <laughs> now remember, we could only sing one song by myself. <laughs> and Brian said, and Brian Gill would sing out and he'd say, "Yeah, play Hey Good Looking." <laughs> and just like that. 
We'll leave that one for a while. Oh, sing a Merle Angus song. <laughs> this poor bastard, he just stood there and froze. Like, he, me <laughs> he just melted in the middle of the room. And he said, I'll tell you what, we'll do them later, but let's get on with Cheek <laughs> All that sort of stuff went down, but those old shows, yeah, they, they were combinations of everything, mm. circus acts and mm. stuff like that. Like, a lot of people don't know, but Happy Jack Hill, who you've probably seen, mm. ridden his bulls. Yeah, yeah, been you know, his bulls. You look at old Happy getting around now, you know, the old dad of the family and that, but Happy was an absolute um, pristine, talented drummer oh, in wow. a circus. Yeah, I've got old photos here of him playing the drums in <laughs> Souls or someone, Lennon's or somewhere. Yeah, Ashton's uh, playing drums, you know. <laughs> Peter was a, a tightrope, loose wire walker, juggler, acrobat, wow. all that sort of stuff. Brian was Brian was probably, I know whips have come a long way now with whip cracking comments, but at the time, Brian would have been the best whip cracker in Australia. Yeah, at wow. the time, and rope spinner. So all that sort of stuff was all in, incorporated yeah. into the old, old muck jump shows, yeah. And I heard with them, like, because um, they have the kids on the road too, and they put them in a new school every town. Um, yeah, they did if they were side showing. Yeah. Because they'd be in there for a week. Mm. But night showing was generally homeschooling. Yeah. Um, yeah, they homeschooled all the kids. Uh, some of the um, young Brian, I know he went to um, he went to s school in Sydney. While a lot of the time the family was on the road mm. um, with those shows. But yeah, most of it was homeschooling unless they were side showing. Like, mm. like I said, side showing you were there for a week. Yeah. You know? Um, night showing, you were packed up on the road, and, and you were gone. You know, so, but uh, and the kids, you look at those, you look at any of those kids that travel with showmen. They're all street wise. They're all smart. They're yeah. all done well for themselves. Mm. You know, and it's all it's all street marks, <laughs> smart stuff you know, yeah. that, that they pick up. But, um, but yeah, that, and then we left. I think we got down. I was I was really sore, and it was I think seventy. Yeah, it must have been late 72, or just before Mount Isa anyway. And um, I said to the family, I said, look, I've got to make the break, I'm sore, I can't ride anymore, I've been doing this, you know, so long. And, and as much as I've enjoyed it, and there was no worries, and away we went, and um, I think we went up and did Longreach Rodeo, that was the next next rodeo, got our old Chev on the road, and, <laughs> and away we went, and uh, yeah, we did Longreach and, and Mount Isa. And, and Terry Drennan was a guy called... Uh, they called him Super Saddle, <laughs> nicest bloke, top bloke, always lifelong friend. You know, yeah. he's he's still living in Toowoomba. He's a farrier up there, but um, he he come with us on the road. He come with us, and um, he would he won a lot a lot of money. He'd been over to New Zealand, won a lot of money, and he was he was really riding saddle broncs good. And something said, oh, I'll just go with Jack Gill for a couple of months, <laughs> and you know. So um, he came with the show, and when he left, he went up and won uh, straight up and won the world title. At, Mount Isa, oh, they wow. had a world title there, yeah, and uh, he went up and won that, and uh, it was pretty, uh, he donated his saddle to the Longreach Hall of Fame, it was an amazing story, this is a little bit of a side one, so I went out years later and went through the Hall of Fame and didn't have any write up of who'd won the saddle or what it was for, I had World Series on it, but who'd won it or who he was or anything like that, it just had a little plaque right down the bottom a little tag saying donated by T Drennan. So, you know, we all said to him, Jesus, you get, well, at least could have trumped you up. And he's a really humble guy, yeah. Terry. And then, oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Years later again, he's taken his wife out to, and they've gone out to have a bit of a trip and look at the Hall of Fame. He'd <laughs> never been there. <clears throat> it just so happened that I had a tour guide that was coming through. So they followed the tour guide. And when it got to Terry's saddle, the tour guide, who's only a young bloke, who Terry's never seen before in his life, he said, now this saddle was won by a mate of mine. <laughs> and Terry looked at him, looked at his wife, and I, a mate of mine, the bloke, it was full of bullshit. You know? <laughs> and, and Terry just, I said, did you, like, me being me, I would have been my golden chance to jump up and say, excuse me, can I say something about this? <laughs> yeah. But Terry never, he just, he just let it go. Let it go. Yeah, this saddle was won by a great mate of mine. <laughs> yeah, and well, he was with the show. Yeah, yeah. And he yeah he was a really he was a really good bronc rider. And I used to open the show on a mare called Sharp and Kate. And of course, when Terry joined the show, I said, "She's yours. You open the show on her." You know? <laughs> and it was really good. It was spectacular watching him ride, doing an opening ride. You know, 
So, uh, but yeah, a lot, a lot of good cowboys, mate, went through those old tent shows. And you'd have to be tough getting on that much. You got sore and, you know, and you, you get knocked about. No, fortunately, nothing broken, but skin off. You just got knocked about loading the seats off. The grant, you know, the seats <laughs> yeah. inside onto a truck or something, you know. And, <laughs> and of course, I was a bareback rider and saddle bronc rider, so yeah, I got doubly, I, I hit double, you know, riding <laughs> bareback horses and saddle broncs in there as well, you know. So it's like at least four horses a night. Well, it was at the end, yeah. yeah. It was started off two. Yeah. Um, it actually started off on, actually it started off, I was just doing one bareback ride, because uh, we had plenty of tent riders. Uh, we probably had about six, six mm -hmm. tent riders, you know, and a few of the tent hands wanted to learn to ride, so we'd, we'd put them on. And um, so, but then as they dropped out and it got less and less of us, it got down to two or three of us and they left and it was just sort of like me and, you know, <laughs> and that's what happened to Brian Gill. He, um, I think it was the day we left, we got back to Charleville mm. and left the show at Charleville and they went on to show at Dargaminder, I think it was, and um, Brian had long given up rodeo, and, but there was no one else that he had to hop on. And he hopped on, I think the horse flipped over and broke his leg or something, which, oh, wow. yeah, which compounded towards his, towards his passing away later on, you know, with infections and cancer and stuff like that. But um, that's when it got tough. And they just kept the show on the road. Yeah. Yeah, one night at Tambo, we, I reckon there was, it rained. The only time it ever rained was Tambo. And I said to Jack, what do we do here? You know, and he said, well, the show goes on. <laughs> you know, you know. Get a so we did full all yeah, get a jack. We did all we did all the clown acts, um, rode everything that was a bit and there would have been ten people there. And they stayed to help us pull the tent down. So yeah, like John Williamson song, tied up with wire just to keep the show on the road. <laughs> and that was it, yeah. That was a good part about it, you know, doing it and stuff. And then we sort of yeah, seventy two, we got back into rodeo. But I sort of I was sort of picking the eyes out of rodeo that I, that yeah. I wanted to do, and um, and we would uh, yeah because there was there was a lot of dinky rodeos yeah. around you know no atmosphere and I was an atmosphere person you know and I just loved the big atmosphere the big rodeo this is the showman sort of side yeah of and I was clowning I was bullfighting at the time I started that in '69 and that was me pay packet yeah. if I went to Mount Isa I was guaranteed five hundred yeah great for the till up till about seventy five seventy six. I was guaranteed 500. I was right. I was kind of hard work and I was doing like comedy acts. And but didn't you do it all on your own? Some I did, did the eyes are on my own, yeah. If I needed a, a man for a, 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 what they call a dummy clown for a comedy act, I'd give someone five bucks or whatever it was at the time and <laughs> to come out and make up and I'd pour water over them or whatever, blow them <laughs> yeah. up. We used explosives. I got my hands on some explosives. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> I got this. I got this firm that I still can't disclose. Would make me these jellic night. I think it was dynamite or jellic night cordite bombs. <laughs> blow this house off the map, you know. And away we went. Oh, this is funny. Let's blow this up. <laughs> and um, yes, but that clown and, and comedy um, was, uh, and and the whole the whole basis of it. I find I started in '69, but when I went in that tent show, it was <clears throat> excuse me, it was professional comedy. Mm. This was circus clowning, circus acts, and it was rehearsed stuff, and it was, it was tried and, mm. and proven stuff that worked. And um, so I carried that on into the big arenas, doing comedy, you know, yeah. doing big shows, big, you know, with a lot of comedy and bullfighting as well. And like I, I teamed up with Pat Speedy for a few big ones. Yeah. Um, and that was really good. That was an education. What did you, what'd you think of fighting his bulls? Oh. <laughs> What did he think of fighting his bulls? That's what I want to know. Why the hell would you want him when you're going to go and fight him? But, but that was Pat. He was the toughest man I ever knew. Mm. We did corral them once. John Singleton run three big rodeos. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll, I'll get on to Pat Speedy because I don't, I've seen other bullfighters, you know, and I'm not softening them up at all. They do a great job. And that's the way it's supposed to be. And they are professional athletes. And it works great with three. But the money wasn't about. Mm. And even if you had to split the money out between two of you, that was a big loss, you know. <laughs> And anyway, John Singleton ran a series of rodeos, big rodeos, and he was a big promoter in Sydney at the time, <clears throat> massive rodeos, Corralman, Adelaide and Sydney. So we're doing Sydney, 20,000 people, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> Speedy's got bulls there, Macarad bulls there, but anyway, uh, 
It was like, oh yeah, this is one of such as such as bulls, you know, they'll be easy right now. Oh shit, here comes easy, come easy, go. This is one of Pat's and we were doing Corralbin and his own we had a guy called Rod McMahon. Um we used to call him Never Nod Rod. He was not no he was a good bull rider, but but it took him a long while to get out. Anyway, he'd drawn this rank bull of Pat's called Easy Come, Easy Go, and he had a half horn, a cocker horn, a sawn off horn, and um, we said, and he was, he was notorious for getting hung up on bulls rod, and we said, is he gonna be there for the duration? What's the plan, you know? And Pat said, well, I'll go in and try and straighten this bull up. He's real tight spinning bull, and I'll go in and straighten him up. He said, and you see if you can get McMahon off, you know, just grab him anywhere and drag him or whatever you can, you know, if you can't get the tail of the rope. So that was the plan. Pat jumped, it went to plan, he, he fell off, he got hung up, and Pat jumped in front of the bull, and the bull hit him right in the buttocks. Yeah, hit him, hit him right in his bum, and just broke him open. Oh, really? Yeah, and and he wouldn't get in the ambulance, and I looked, and I went, oh, I looked down, he's crying on jumbos, and I was just horrified, and, and he didn't win, she just sat there, and I, I carried on, and the, his brother was a dentist, I think. Yeah, it was, his brother was, and his brother stitched him up. Like, <laughs> He didn't go to hospital, he did this. It was, oh, a couple of weeks later, he, the following day, I, I got a, a bloke that had done a bit of clown work and corral on me, finish it off. Um, the next one we did was Sydney, um, I think it was Sydney, and, and he was back on track again. He was the toughest man, the toughest, toughest man I've ever seen. But he did some, the, he did some outrageous things with animal acts at rodeos and comedy. Oh, really? He nearly got me mur he nearly got me killed in Sydney. Like <laughs> twenty thousand people and we were doing this blow up act with them good bombs on stuff. The illegal the illegal fireworks. <laughs> and we had a gag where we had a painted up old cardboard box as a washing machine and or hat cleaner. Mm. And we were coming to Sydney because we we're following the rodeo circuit, cleaning hats. That's where we made our money. And to cut a long story short, we had all these old hats that we had plants in the crowd mm. and they would hand us all these old hats that they didn't want, we'd collect for a few weeks. Yeah. So we put the hats in on top of the bomb and in this old machine and um, then we would put in a secret ingredients to clean the hats and then I'll go and switch it on and we'd both walk away and when we took five steps away, we had a guy at the side of the arena on Belvoir, yeah. Mary Belvoir, that touched <laughs> on a battery and nothing came down. Cardboard was just ash. The hats were just blown in half, and you couldn't, <laughs> oh, you couldn't, what? you couldn't recognise where they was. So I've done this act on my own pretty good, but I've got Pat working with me in Sydney. So I've collected my two or three hats and gone to put them in. And when I look in there, there's hundred dollar resistols and Baileys, and people think it's a joke. Like a magician gives you twenty bucks and he rips it up. You know you're going to get your twenty bucks back. So he's got people handing hats. And instead of knocking them back, he's taken them. <laughs> and he's put them all in. There's about 20 hats in there. There's a $1,000 worth of hats in there. <laughs> and I went, shit, what are we going to do? Are we going to touch this off? Or, the, you know, they've got 20,000 people watching. What's going to happen? She's got to go off. So we walked away and I did my little trip or whatever I did. And the bloke went, boom, and just blew all his hats to pieces. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I said to him, shit, where'd you get the hats from? He said, oh, people just give them to me. <laughs> So I said, we're going to have to get out of here. And they had this massive big stage with, they had the dressing rooms at each end of it. So we made a break for the dressing room and I just, my makeup used to be under baby, on top of baby oil. Mm. So I grabbed a rag and I could wipe it all off. But Pat put on this sweetest makeup they had and it, you had to scrape it off with a chisel, you know. <laughs> and, and anyway, we got the dressing room and there's a crowd of people already out the back of the dressing oh, room. Yeah. Their hats. Yeah, and Singleton had a bull rider, a footballer bloke called Forrester Grayson, and he was our security man and he was holding the crowd back so they were going to lynch us. So we're going to put a rope around that <laughs> right there at Sydney Showgrounds. <laughs> so I've just pulled my makeup off, I'm down in my underpants, and I grabbed my jeans and boots and hat, and the only escape was across the stage. And Reg Lindsay's band's playing country music there. And I've got my boots and the underpants on and my hat on. <laughs> and I'm crawling across. I'll never forget the look on the drummer's face. He's looking at me behind him. What's going on here? And I made a break and I got away and put my clothes on. And then I come back to see what happened to Speedy. And he's, he's, he's out. He's confessing to all this. 
anyway to people again. You're supposed to be funny, you're a clown, and you know, like the kids lost their hats and everything. <laughs> the next thing I see, he used to do these animal acts with little goats and things. He's got a little baby goat and he's trading the baby goat off the hats <laughs> to, the, to, the, to these kids. But oh, gee, he was he was a good bloke, but a nightmare with things like that going wrong. If you would work him as speedy, except for bullfighting, mm. he was absolutely brilliant. He was was absolutely brilliant and a tough man, yeah. you know. And, uh, and had the worst bulls on the whole run. <laughs> yeah. Bulls were the worst bulls, you know. But, uh, and, but if you're working with him in the show side of it, then it was a nightmare. Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> the comedy and stuff like that, yeah. He blew me up in Adelaide. He, I had a, <clears throat> we got there and he was supposed to have a big leather harness to put around my legs and my back and my bum and tie it all on with straps and we strap a lump of dynamite on it. Then we had a shotgun, sawn off shotgun, that had fake cartridges used to blow out black smoke, bang, like that, right? And as he did that, I had a piece of bell wire in my hand and wires running back to the bomb on the arse on this big leather harness, and I would touch it off, and it would oh, blow you from here to the other side of the room, you know? <laughs> but, but, yeah, it wouldn't burn you, it would just knock you down. And we got Adelaide, and I said, where's the harness? And he goes, oh, I forgot it. And I said, well, we're not doing the act. He said, oh, I've done it before with a 4X beer carton instead of the harness. <laughs> Stupid me! took his word for it, I strapped this beer carton and tied it up with bale and twine and I touched this bomb off and it just disintegrated the cardboard, <laughs> burnt through me, jo I had a pair of luminous green jocks on at the time, burnt through me, <laughs> through me green jocks and they just, I got, I remember I was in the ambulance tent and they're peeling the green jocks off me and for every bit of that green jocks that they peeled off me, a bit of me ass come away with it. <laughs> and Pat Speed, he said, you only got half an hour, we've got to be back on, you know, the bull ride. <laughs> so, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he was a good, fortunately about, oh, it must have been about four years ago now, four or five years ago, I uh, compared the Hall of Fame induction that they have at Warwick and um, not taking anything away from the other cowboys that, that we inducted into the Hall of Fame the night. I did a lot of research on everybody and it was a great night, but I really enjoyed doing Speedy. I really, well, they inducted Pat Speedy yeah. into the Hall of Fame and I really, really enjoyed doing it. <laughs> yeah, it was good. He was, it was because I'd work with him and knew him. It was, it was you deserve to be there, man. You know, yeah. you were the best. You were the best of the best. Yeah. yeah. It was... Um it's crazy to think what you were doing back then. You could never do that nowadays. I think it was 2002, Kath and I had done a trip up. We, were, we used to catch, after I quit radio, I was catching and processing buffalo up in the Kakadu National Park. So we did a trip up there to see where we used to live and we came back via Mount Isa. And uh, the guy that was doing the comedy there, he approached me, you know, and um, he had, he was doing some, explosive, supposed to be explosive acts. <clears throat> they were just little strobe lights going poof, poof, you know. <laughs> and he said, they tell me you used to use real dynamite. <laughs> and I went, yeah, yeah, we used to use real dynamite, you know, <laughs> just blow the shit out of everything we could think of. <laughs> I blew up a pair of trousers one night at Toowoomba and I was very lucky because it was an old pair of braces, denim braces, and they had bra um, those brass buckles on mm -hmm. them. And someone come down out of the, later on out the back of the chutes and said, hey mate, you know, that's a bit dangerous. So he said, something hit up behind us on the wall, went whistling past our ear. He said, we grabbed it, he said, and it was the buckle off your braces, you know. And that was 50 metres away, that thing got blown. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but um, you could get away with it. Yeah. You could get away with it. And that dynamite, would it blow a big hole in the ground? Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to do it. My main act was I used to put a fake firecracker down the trousers mm -hmm. and the other clown tried to light it and we would have that bomb planted in the arena with a little bit of sand on top of it and the bell wire went across to a very trusted friend <laughs> and I would see this. I had a piece of tar fuse in a fake firecracker and the people would see the tar fuse burning down and then I'd scramble out of the jumbos and leave them on top of the bomb <laughs> And then I'd race away in a pair of ladies' bloomers that I had on underneath and trip and fall. And when I tripped and fell, that's when my trusted friend touched the battery off and it blew, oh yeah, blew a hole in the arena where I could fill it in and blew the shit out of the trousers and anything else. <laughs> and that same rodeo, I had a guy, a dummy clown for me, a guy called Evan Houston, and we put a bit of sand, so we knew where the bomb was, it was different colour, we put a bit of sand on top of it. And... Um, 
we had a half a bucket of sand or whatever, and then on the way back towards the chutes, the bed, he tipped the sand out, and um, I was sitting on top of the wrong uh, bit of sand. I was sitting on the sand that he tipped out of the bucket, thinking I was on the bomb. <laughs> And then when I run and tripped over, my face went down. I looked right in front of me and about half a metre away was the proper sand that was there. <laughs> and the guy touched it off and it, oh, I got sand burned all my eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we had a few close calls with the blower. You didn't lose any fingers or anything? No, nah, someone did down the track a bit. Yeah. Someone else took over the gag and someone else didn't look after the, um, look after the bombs. But the first lot that was sent to... Um, Kath and I, we had our caravan or our van and there was a fruit bowl sitting up on top of the fridge in the caravan. And when these things arrived, they were sent you know, undercover as firecrackers or something. And I said, oh, well, put them in that fruit bowl there. We'll know where they are. And Kath's stack, there's about eight or ten of them all bundled <laughs> up. And uh, all these bits of bell wire all hanging out of it. And <clears throat> anyway, I got a phone call from the secretary of the rodeo to ring this number, see? So I ring up the number and it's a guy that makes these bombs, you know. And he said, oh, I just want you to check something. He said, can you get those bombs out of the box? He said, and just check that all the bell wire is twitched together on each bomb. And I'm looking <coughs> at these things sitting in the fruit bowl and I said, oh, yeah, why? And he said, because, he said, like a taxi or any high-frequency radio, like a police car, will set these things up. <laughs> we, we just would have... Oh, we would have got blown to pieces, so we had to twitch all the bell wire up and put them out in the truck somewhere, you know. Yeah. So that was pretty, that was, that, that was good. It was, it was fun times and good, and good money. Like I said, that was, that was my dollars. I, yeah. I only had scraped up the scraps rodeo and mm. I loved it, but, you know. Um, you liked the showman side of it. Well, I did, but there was times you had your ups and downs as well. Like I knew cowboys that had almost slashed their wrist if they didn't got thrown off a bull at a mm. national fight. Or anything like that. I'd never got down it just once, just once. I, it was at a national finals in there, but I ever got serious, and it was the first time I'd ever looked like ever winning anything at a national finals, you know. And it was only because I'd ridden all my horses, four horses. It was at Nambour, and the bareback riding was about seven at night. And of course, me, I always loved me surf and swimming and everything. I'd come, I was sunburned as all hell and <laughs> put my shirt on. And the horse of the the horse of the finals was a horse called Funny Face, Ian Wayne's Funny Face. Mm. Um, he'd been chucking bareback riders off in the in the rounds every night, or someone would win on him, you know. And I was just dreaming of getting on this horse, you know, just dreaming about getting on him. <clears throat> but think about it, I only had one horse to ride. Like a nice mediocre horse would have been good, but that's the way you are. That's <laughs> yeah. the way. That's the way you think. And run him up, run him up, you know. Yeah. So a guy called John Rain helped me gear him up, you know, tell me how to ride him <laughs> and all the rest of it. And uh, I only had to make time on him. And that wasn't in my mind. It was to go out and ride him as the best of a could, which wasn't very good at any time, but the best I could, you know. And that was it. I would have won the average at the finals. Um, that horse threw me two jumps out of that shoot, snapped me out of that rig and the rosin screeched. <laughs> and I sat on, I got thrown out the back of him. I always remember I landed on my ass, and I can remember tears coming out my eyes. I'm thinking, you bloody great soup, you know, <laughs> wipe the tears away, you know. But I'd built myself up for the first time ever. I'd built myself up too much. Must be like Olympic medalists and stuff. Yeah. And built up that too. pressure. Yeah, and when I came in that afternoon and looked at the draw and I got funny face, that pressure just... It's got too much. Yeah, like they could have run him into the tent and I wouldn't have thought, so, you know, or anywhere, backyard, someone's backyard arena, I wouldn't have thought about it. But the fact that I just had that one chance to win an average out of finals, you know. But on the same token, you know, I knew I had 50, 14 other bareback riders who were a lot better than me yeah. that deserved the title, <laughs> you know. But just the way things go at finals, funny things happen at mm. national finals. But, yeah, I never, <clears throat> I never, and then towards the, Towards, I started wrestling steers and I, I thought that was good. I loved that. It was all a challenge of timing and riding. And you, and know, you said you picked that up pretty quick. I did. Yeah, Gary McPhee sort of talked me into it. And I said, yeah. So I went to uh, one of Gary's schools and then he said, oh, look, next week I've got a school. I just want to fine tune you on a few things. And, and he was taking his... Gary was really good. I think Gary could sort of spot that someone really liked what they were doing or was into it, just wasn't there to turn up to, you know, work another event. And I really got to like it. And because, although I, 
Although I never carried on with horses, with time event horses or cutting horses and my whole life I was into horses. I was born on the things, you know, and show jumping and all that until I was like 14 or 15 years of age, show circuit in the Hunter Valley. So I knew how to ride a horse. And that's that's the part, the timing, and that's in, in barriers and that, that was the part that I didn't have any problem with. Mm. I didn't have any problem with steering or for a, I saw a lot of other cowboys in that era who weren't horsemen, mm. they, they might have been a, they might have been a blacksmith in Melbourne, mm. they, you know, they, they might have been a carpenter or a plumber or whatever, as mm. cowboys are, they're all different occupations. And um, I saw a lot of them have trouble in scoring like and, and timing mm. and the actual riding of the horse. Yeah. Whereas that never really, that never worried me, it all just come natural, you know? Yeah. And I was picking up a dollar, so horses, were available to me. Gary was really good. He had a horse at the time called Trapper that was the number one steer wrestling horse in Australia. So, you know, he'd let me run off that. Des, Des o, he had a team of horses. Nev McCarthy, he had a good team. And so I always had a horse to run off, you know, <laughs> always. But um, yeah, I enjoyed steer wrestling and I dropped off bareback riding in the yeah. last year. And just, just, wrestled just, steer. just did steer wrestling. Yeah, and then I tried to stay connected to rodeo through announcing, judging. Mm. You know, and um, I just, if I couldn't ride, I didn't want to be there. Yeah. Simple as that. <laughs> didn't want to be there. <coughs> and so I just took up barefoot water ski and I <laughs> got into that. And then everything else, bloody fishing and Christ knows yeah. what, scuba diving and <laughs> surfing and anything, anything to sort of keep my mind busy and do something athletic or do something that keeps me fit. Mm. That's sort of, and I'm still in, I go down the beach every morning, ride a long board down there with the old boys, you know. <laughs> and they're like cowboys. They all talk about the 1960s. Oh, what about we surfed at such a manly in 1960s? <laughs> all this bullshit. i got to sit here and listen to it. And I got away from all that at rodeo. I didn't want to hear <laughs> talk about um, the bull they rode in Darwin in 1973 or whatever. <clears throat> but I loved, I loved riding and, and riding. I love riding bucking horses. I rode bucking horses in people's backyard. Mm. And you just love it, you know. <laughs> and you think someone that loved bucking horses so much and riding so much would be a natural champion, but I just didn't have the competitive side in mm. me, you know, to get up there in that, that top of the yeah, top yeah. of the ladder thing, you know. And being married, um, I love my wife and my, and my, my daughter, and so the funds would be getting down a little bit, and save borrowing entry fees or borrowing food money or petrol money or that. I'd just go and get a job for a few weeks, yeah. so I'd miss a few rodeos. Mm. Yeah, so there was, a, there was a lot of guys in my era that did a lot more rodeos than I did. A lot more travel solid, you know. Mm. Like they had the ass out of their trousers, sleeping <laughs> in swags on people's verandas and, you know, <laughs> food in takeaway joints, you know, and all that sort of stuff. But in that era, you could do that. Mm. Uh, the only swags you see people in now is up in the high country when they're camping. And stuff <laughs> yeah. like that, you know, where, it They're was, a bit fancy nowadays too, oh, and a, rooftop tents. And yeah, all. rooftop tents and all that stuff. Yeah, we got all that stuff now. You know, <laughs> yeah. We say, wish we had this. And wish, we had, yeah, wish we had this and wish we had it. But I can remember my first swag was this oh, disastrous old mattress. But this is how you can luck out sometimes. Uh, myself and a mate called Hunter Russell were in Sydney, and um, we were staying at someone's place in Sydney, waiting to go somewhere to do a rodeo, and. We actually had some clothes to um, wash, so we went to this laundromat in Sydney. And wouldn't you know it, there in the laundromat is where somebody was doing all um, Qantas Airlines <laughs> or Ansett Airlines blankets and sheets and everything you know, for all their airlines and that. <laughs> so man, had to come away and we got these flash swags with this silk around the blankets <laughs> and all this blankets. Roll it up, quick roll it up, get it in the car. <laughs> so we had these uh, flash swags, but yeah, it was, um, everybody slept in swags yeah. on rodeo grounds. And that's the way it was. Mm. It was good. No, today I feel I feel sorry for the pressures on Cal. Like you've, you've got a plane from Melbourne mm. all the way up here. It's costly. Yeah. It's costly to do it. And I don't know whether the bull riders realise, but I don't see... I don't see the money going up that high mm. um, in relation to the cost of living. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how someone well, now entry would. Entry fees are one hundred and ninety dollars. There you go. Mm. You know, entry fees. I think Mount Isa was ten bucks or something. <laughs> yeah. it went up to twenty, and everyone whinged about it. You know? 
but um, and that was that was another thing about that that era that that I rodeoed in was we were our era was at the forefront of rule changes to make things better for rodeo. Now whether we did or not, I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> things like that can come back to bite you on the ass. But um, we lost it. We brought in the ruling of arenas happened to be ploughed up. There was horses getting hurt. There was cowboys getting hurt. You know. And we brought that ruling up and we lost a lot of rodeos mm. because the committees wouldn't conform with it. Oh, we'll just go to Bushman's Carnival, we don't care. Yeah. So we had to contend with that. And our, in, our annual general meetings, so I don't know what they're like now, but they were shit fights. Like she was all in nearly brawls <laughs> at our annual general meetings, you know, that we used to have Warwick every year. But it was always fighting for something. Mm. We fought to get out of the old Davison and Smith slide and see Poli saddles. We brought in an A saddle. We fought to get out of the A saddle into international bronc riding saddle. And then the big change came when the first of the cowboys, not the first, but the first big volume of cowboys went to the United States. Mm. And when they came back, they said, things have got to change here. Mm. <clears throat> so, okay, this is where it come back to bite me on the ass. We, a lot of things changed to American ways, which were great and uh, rule changes and different things and the way rodeos were run, quick performance rodeos. Okay, where it come back to bite you in the ass is we don't have the population of the United States. Mm. We can't afford to spend the money on rodeos that they spend. Yeah. And you know that, you're a promoter. Um, so what we were trying to do was take this polished rodeo performance production and drop it into Springshaw, Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't yeah. work. Yeah, didn't work, and and a lot of rodeos dropped out mm. be, because of it. You know, they they would have their committee, and everyone would volunteer, and the road crew would run the rodeo. They would come in and build an arena over six months. Everyone would help. The local blokes on properties would supply a lot of stock, and it was a great big day out. Now that same little town that had a great big day out and made good money for charity just can't afford. Yeah, to bring the in the contractors, big stadiums, and yeah. so the bull riding seems to be going good. PBR yeah. seems to be going really good because it can, it's fast. It can go into the cities. It can go into the big mm. population. But once you move out to the outer, outer spaces, uh, those big rodeos with big crowds, they're pretty much gone, mm. dusted. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we did from wanting these big promotions. You know, we wanted to be better cowboys. We want to be like the Americans. Mm. We want to be competitive with the Americans. But it just never worked out that way because now to be competitive with the Americans, you go to America. Yeah. And you go to the United States, <laughs> and that's where you find out if you can compete against the Americans, you know. But still love it, still mm. in my blood. <laughs> yeah. It's um, we didn't even get to touch on half of the other stuff, the uh, entertaining and all that. But I've uh, got right. a plane leaving soon, so right. we're going to have to wrap it up. the plane. <laughs> It was right. an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much it's for all right, coming. Bennett. Good to have you, man. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a part two or part three. We'll in the do future. that. <laughs> we'll do that. Stage two of David Charles, <laughs> <not> the fourth. <laughs> yeah, Thank mate. you very much. You're welcome, mate. <laughs>